the decision. This idea that somehow there are UI designers that are different than UX designers, that's complete crap. There's no difference. It's what level you're working at. Every resolution has a different set of problems and every resolution demands a different set of solutions. How all of the different roles in software development can work together, what's the place of a business analyst and how can we coordinate um, these different perspectives uh, and people working together to deliver customer value. จะวัดแล้วว่าเราไปสู่ระดับโลกได้ไหมคนกลุ่มนี้บอกว่าเราไปได้เป้าหมายของเราเพื่อคนไทยเราพาอีเวนต์ระดับโลกมาให้คนไทยผมรู้สึกว่าเราอาชีพเป้านั้นดูจากสิ่งที่ทุกคนตอบรับมาจริงๆเราอยากจะช่วยให้คนไทยที่จริงๆเขาไม่ไม่ได้มีเข้าถึงธนาคารทําให้เขาไม่มีโอกาสในการใช้เทคโนโลยีหรือว่าดิจิตอลหรือแอปพลิเคชันที่ง่ายๆหรือที่ดีๆเพราะฉะนั้นเราคิดว่าจริงๆแล้ว UX เนี่ยสำคัญกับเรามากเพราะว่าเราอยากจะบริ้งให้เขาเนี่ยมีชีวิตหรือว่าสามารถเข้าถึงการเงินเนี่ยเหมือนกับคนอื่นก็รู้สึกค่อนข้างตื่นเต้นที่เห็นงานได้ใหญ่ขึ้นทุกปีโดยเฉพาะปีนี้คือมีสปิเกอร์จากต่างประเทศหลายคนก็ให้ความสนใจในเมืองไทยแล้วก็มาให้ความรู้กับเรา The idea behind at least 2019 was how can we build an event that uh, exposes the Thai community to really show like, what is the very best out there to inspire the, the nation. And then we'll also build in workshops that allow us to upskill this community. Look where we want to go. Don't look down at the ground about what sucks right now. Strategy is not a plan. It's not a plan, and we can't fool ourselves thinking that we could just make a whole list of all the things we want to build, and that will get us value. ยินดีต้อนรับนะคะเข้าสู่ Digital Experience Design นะคะธนาคารกรุงเทพนะคะวันนี้นะคะดิฉันการเกตสิงทองนะคะเป็น Design PM นะคะของธนาคารกรุงเทพนะคะก็ขอยินดีต้อนรับทุกคนนะคะก็เดี๋ยวไม่ให้เป็นการเสียเวลานะคะก็เชิญพี่ชนนะคะ Head of Digital Experience นะคะธนาคารกรุงเทพค่ะเชิญค่ะสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับโอเคก่อนอื่นเลยขอบคุณมากๆนะครับที่เชื่อใน knowledge ของเราหรือเปล่าที่มาจอยกันวันนี้นะครับก็ขอบคุณมากๆแล้วรู้สึกอบอุ่นนะครับสถานที่อาจจะแคบไปนิดนึงแต่รู้สึกว่ามันอบอุ่นดีเนาะก็ขอบคุณมากๆครับทุกคนปรบมือทีมงานปรบมือให้ออเดียนทุกคนที่มาร่วมงานในวันนี้นะครับขอบคุณมากๆนะครับแล้วก็สั้นๆนะครับขอบคุณทีมงานที่ช่วยจัดสถานที่เนาะจากที่ทํางานมากลายเป็นเขาเรียกไลฟ์สเตทแล้วก็ปรบมือให้ตัวเองหน่อยนะครับที่ร่วมกันจัดงานแล้วก็สร้างการเปลี่ยนแปลงจากการทำรีเสิร์ชอะไรต่างๆจนแอปพลิเคชันธนาคารกรุงเทพของเราเริ่มมีการเปลี่ยนแปลงแล้วก็มีทิศทางในเรื่องของ user experience ที่ดีนะครับปรบมือให้ตัวเองด้วยครับทีมงานโอเค now it's time โอเคก็เดี๋ยวขอต้อนรับคุณเอลิเก้นะครับเขาก็จะมาสปีกในเรื่องเกี่ยวกับงานรีเสิร์ชที่เราใช้เมโทรลิจีต่างๆทีรีต่างๆ,ๆ,ๆ,ๆ,ๆ,ๆ,ๆ,ๆ,ๆ,ๆ,ๆนะครับแล้วก็มีเช็คแชร์เคสสตัดดี้ที่เราใช้จริงๆในในช่วงตัวดีไซน์ที่ผ่านมาแล้วก็สำหรับเขาเรียกว่างานดีไซน์โซลูชันในต่อๆไปนะ and now please welcome Mr. e l i g e thank you thank you Wow! Thanks, everybody. Is this my camera? Which one's my camera? That's my camera. This is my camera. 
Nice, lovely, lovely. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is one of my favorite countries to speak on. Um, I say that in every country, but this time I really, really, really mean it. But I'm a bit nervous. And the reason I'm nervous is not just because it's my first time speaking in Bangkok. It's also because the shortest course I teach at my university on product discovery lasts eight hours, okay? So in order to all come back home before 5 a.m., is that I need your full participation, okay? And I need your highest energy. Is that a thing that we can do at home too? So I need you to do a little exercise. Could we all stand up for a second, just for a second, I promise, 15 seconds. And I need you all to start clapping very slowly, start clapping very slowly, okay? And now as I go up, let's start clapping higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And now go crazy, go crazy! All right, Bangkok, let's go crazy. That's right. Woo! Okay, now stop, 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 stop. So this is in case the talk goes horribly. I still have some material to post on Instagram that, oh, it's a beautiful talk. Everyone was super happy, even though it probably will not be the case. No, but really. So my name is uh, Enrique de la Camera. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And uh, today, um, Oh, another camera. And I'm very passionate about designing, delivering, and scaling great products. And what is a great product? A great product, as I understand it, is not just a product that makes businesses successful. It's also a product that makes the user successful, beyond the user, makes society successful, and even the planet successful. So those are the kind of products I love working on, right? And so today, in the next five, six hours we have today, seven hours? six hours in the next six hours what i want you to do is show you how i have worked with clients like google like microsoft like ikea like coca-cola and now bbl which is my favorite client so far it didn't pay me to say that a lot and uh teach you how i work with them to use research as a weapon of mass construction construction of what a weapon of mass creation creation of happy customers of loyal customers of profitable customers. So does that sound like a plan? Are we all interested in that? Nice, lovely. So before we start, I know what you're all thinking, right? A presentation on research, like boring, right? Like what are we doing here on a Thursday night in Bangkok? Aren't there better things to do? And um, we believe this because we've been fed an awful lie. What's the great lie that we're believing here? The great lie is, that if it's not hard and boring, it's not good work, right? We all believe that there is no progress without sacrifice. If we want to get good work, we have to suffer a little bit. We have to sacrifice something. And that's a lie, because uh, the best work I've seen produced is the work produced when we're feeling our best. So in order to perform on our best, we need to feel our best. And this is true for research too. The more fun we're having, the more relaxed we can work, and the better the work gets done. So my point today that I want to uh, make across is that not only can we make research innovative and agile and exciting, but that we, sorry, we must make research innovative, agile, and exciting, right? In order to make research the engine, not just of business growth, but of user success. So in order to do that, we're going to do three things today, right? In our way to reimagine research, we're first going to see what's wrong with research today. Once we know what's wrong with it, let's see how we can turn these weaknesses of research into strengths. And then finally, I'm going to give you some tips and tricks so you can start doing today. Well, not today, probably tomorrow, right? Go home, relax, chill, and then tomorrow you can start doing it. I want to hear from you. I want you all to take your phones out. Have you all brought your phones out? Yep. Right? <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, so you all please uh, take your phones out. And what I want you to do is uh, scan this QR code. Let's see if this works. Yeah. And I want you to tell me. Um, what do you think is wrong with research today? I do this in uh, every country I visit, and I'm curious what Thailand thinks the problem with research is. 
So let's give you about one minute. Do you want me to sing while uh, we wait, or do you want me to stay quiet? Maybe I'll stay quiet for the sake of. <laughs> You're too kind. Of people at home can also scan, right? Hello, people at home, I can see you. You can scan the QR, right? Perfect. Right, so methodologies, very complicated. There's a lot of data. There's stakeholder experience, not user. Oh, that's, that's nice. Paperwork, wow. Somewhat boring, yes. Takes a long time, not interesting enough, difficult to understand. All right, lots of numbers, maybe hard for the right participants. Poor Sherbach, scam, yes, yeah, scam is important. All right, so you're all right. I've seen uh, a lot of themes emerge, especially about time and about skills. Love your man bam. Thanks, mom. I'm glad that you could connect from Spain. All right, let's keep it here. So there are six things, six mistakes I've seen repeated across teams, across industries, across the world, across every team I've worked with. These six are the first one. Research is too standard. So a lot of teams that I work with when I come in, I see that they're only relying in one or two methods. Mostly they're either to interviewing too much or just surveying too much. The second is that they're too siloed. So I come in and I work with just researchers. And that's a travesty, right? Not re research should be done by people beyond the research team. The third one is it's too slow. So Seldom do I go into a team and they are able to produce insights, reports, and help below the two-week mark. The fourth one is that it's too linear. So I come in and their process looks always something like we uh, plan the research, we collect the data, we analyze the data, and we produce the report. The fifth is it's too focused, right? So it doesn't challenge assumptions. You give me an objective and we automatically go and plan to that objective instead of challenging. What are we really looking for? Is this gonna be the best analysis that money can buy? And lastly, it's too theoretical. So what I see a lot is that there's not a so what factor, right? So, uh, okay, they're very good at describing what's happening, but not at prescribing what should happen, right? So now what I would like to, uh, to do with you tonight is go, one by one in all these mistakes and see how we can fix them, how we can turn these weaknesses into strengths so that you get all the power of research. Sounds like a plan? Are you still with me? Yeah. Are you asleep? That side's a bit sleepy, no? no? You don't like the plan? Should we do another six? Are we good with the six? Are we good with the six? Nice. So, first one, two standard. Today, the problems we're having are not the problems that we had 10 years ago. The, the user has changed more in the last two years than in the entire previous decade. And so our methods must adapt to these challenges, right? We cannot solve a systemic challenge with a simplistic answer. The answer will be simple and elegant, but not simplistic. And the difference is the more methods we can apply here, not just one method, the more perspective we can gather of the same problem. And our solution will be as rich as the challenge that we have to solve. And there's a, there's a saying, I wonder if you know this in Thailand, to one that only has a hammer, all the problems look like a nail, right? So if you only know how to do interviews or UTs or surveys, all the problems will look the same to you, right? Oh, that we can solve with a survey, we can solve it with an interview. The more methods you have, the more perspective you'll have on the problem. And the better you'll understand the problem and the better you solve the problem. So now, what are the things we have to stop doing and the things we have to start doing? Let's stop with the things we have to do less of. Thanks for my friend for the rights to his meme. So less of, we have to do less on relying and having conversation on do we do just qualitative or quantitative, right? There's so much more variables that I'm gonna show you in a minute that we have to consider. 
So we stop doing that and we do more of trying innovative methods and mixing them up. I was going to try to make you guess what we have to do, maybe in the next one. So how do we do that, especially at BBL? First of all, what decision is being made, right? A lot of research teams are not part of the decision uh, getting the right objective. So what constitutes success here? Before we start the research, what are we trying to achieve? What does success look like for our users that we have to find a solution to, right? What are we trying to accomplish? What are the alternatives? So an example of this might be, how might we raise our profits by 5% or um, how do we decide between two alternative screens for a specific feature, right? Once we understand what success looks like for all the team, then we ask the question, what insight would give me that answer? So if we're trying to design between two screens, one insight, for instance, would be, hey, not, if we get 94% of users agree that alternative B is better than A, would that help us make a decision, right? So what we're doing here is prototyping the result before we get it. Why do we do that? Because once we know what we're looking for, it's easier to build and design the research to get it, right? So once the first thing I do when a PO or a business leader comes to me and says, hey, I need to make this decision, I ask him, okay, what kind of insight would help you make this decision? If I told you that 94% of users prefer A to B, would that make it? And maybe he say, oh, with 75% is enough. Oh, okay. And how many people do we need to say this? If one person says it, it's okay? No, 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 at least we need 200. You see, and in this interaction, we are designing together the right research for the team. And so the last step is very easy, is what is the most cost efficient and time efficient method to get those insights? So now that we know that we need to decide between two screens, and we know that we need 75% of people, uh, of 100 users, um, pick one screen over the other, what is the most time effective way to do it? Or we can do an unmoderated test with this online, right? Or we can break 100 people and make a moderated test. We will, uh, depending on the variables, we will uh, find the best one. My point is, we don't just ask, are we going to do quantitative or are we going to do qualitative? We first ask, hey, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to validate something? Or are we what, trying to explore something? Once we know if we're researching for exploration or validation, the next step is, what is the object of our research? Are we going to focus on what they're saying or on what they're doing their answers or their behaviors and then finally we can agree on a focus are we going to focus more on quantitative or are we going to focus more on qualitative and the answers that come from this graph are not simple research is supposed to be messy because the answers that we want are very messy and are very systemic so we will try many methods not just one and even when we come up with a research route, it will evolve as answers appear, right? Let me show you how this looks like. So the last uh, piece of research we've done, we started just by looking at the analytics and seeing misbehaviors, behaviors that we don't want in our app. So for instance, there was a feature that had a lot of traffic and a lot of drop-off. Hey, what's going on here, right? So once we've picked that signal through quantitative data analytics, we shifted to qualitative um, user interviews, hunting for user stories. Hey, what's happening here? When you use this feature, what happens? What's your context? What is happening around you? What do you need? What are the obstacles to clicking through and your drivers to clicking through so we can reduce your obstacles and amplify the drivers? Once we know those, we then design A-B tests and we perform A-B scorings. So with all these forces they've described in the interviews, we apply them and turn them into prototypes. And those prototypes we're going to score, right? Scoring means we don't just A-B and measure for conversion. We also can measure time. We can measure satisfaction after that A-B test and uh, a whole other host of variables. Once we have that, 
we shift to qualitative again and make an interview based on the prototypes. So based on the prototypes you've just used, what, how do you feel about them, right? What would you make and how can you make them better for you? And we're never going to take into account what they're saying strictly, but we are going to take into account why they're saying it, right? And finally, we shifted back to a mixed method, card sorting, to understand the mental model behind it. So all this, instead of just, okay, let's do a survey and see what's wrong, you know? Or let's do some interviews. No, methods should be connected. Because when we do this, we get an answer that is as rich as the problem we have to solve. And that's the only way to solve these complex problems. Next up, how are we doing? This was just the first out of six. Should we go faster? What do you think? Slower? Oh, faster? Yeah, <laughs> all right. This is good, marvelous. The second one is, so we need a lot of methods. And there's a fear because, oh, we need a lot of technical skills. If we need to do these fast prototypes, we're going to need a lot of UXers and UIs and even engineers sometimes. So how do we bring, how do we ensure that all the technical skills we need are in the team? And that brings us to the second. Research today is too siloed. Research today is mainly done by researchers. This has to end because instead of doing research for some teams, we need to do it with the teams. We need to include everybody in the research because if we include more people in the research, their perspectives will enrich the analysis, but also it will help us be a lot faster because we have more people and because we don't have to spend that much time you know, updating everybody because everybody was in the room. Everybody was part of the process. So it helps us make it more powerful and uh, in less time. So here, what we're going to do less of is less performing research by ourselves. What do you think is going to be the more of? What do you think Drake is going to tell us to do to stop being siloed? Okay, let's give you a mic. Involve everyone. Involve everyone. Absolutely, yes. I don't know if you talked to Drake before this, but that's exactly what Drake says. The best researchers are not performers, are orchestrators. When I hire new researchers, one of the key skills I look for is how good is he at leading other disciplines through their own methodologies, right? And involve them and get the most out of others. So what do we do in the day to day? There's three stages that we need them very involved. The first one is in planning. And here, my favorite thing is to involve business and tech. And a lot of people understand why business needs to be involved in the planning, because they are the ones that are going to establish the objectives. But not a lot of people understand the tech at the beginning. Why do you think I involve tech at the beginning? Any ideas? Implementation, yes, and feasibility analysis. That's good. That is correct. Yes, Carl. Yes, that's the key. So two reasons. If they're not involved in planning and we invest in an idea and then we bring research and we bring everyone in, even customers, and we validate it, and then at the end, tech says, oh, but we cannot do this then all of our time, all of our money, and the user's money, wasted. So by including tech at the beginning, we are included at the feasibility layer. But also, as Carl said, engineers have a lot of knowledge about what can we do, the latest possibilities of technology. So when there's an update, they're the first ones to know. So by including them, we are also enriching the quality of the ideas we're having. Because they can say, hey, do you know? To solve that problem, we could use this new update. Oh, wow. Suddenly, tech is not only a layer right, to see if we can do something, but an engine of new somethings, of new ideas, of new possibilities. The second is execution. And it's very important that everybody is involved in execution because that will save you hours of going back and forth on, yeah, but what does this number come from? And what does this number come from? And what does that explanation of that number and that number, right? A lot of like countless hours will be just 
in your pocket back if they're included in the execution, because everybody will know where each number come from, and also it will enrich discussions, because many professionals listen with unique ears. So the business people will listen, users say things like, oh, I like to use this better than that competitor. Whereas the UX will listen other things like, oh, it's very difficult to me to use this when I'm in the subway. While the UI will listen to other things like, oh, I don't like the interaction or the colors here, right? So by including everyone, it will be better for the execution and for the analysis, because then we'll bring much wider uh, array of ideas when ideating, okay? So that's for uh, the siloed. Thing is, if we involve a lot of people, we will be very slow, right? Oh, we have to involve 20 people, 30 people, that will slow us down a lot, right? Wrong, why? Because as I, as I told you, if everyone is in it from the beginning, you will save countless hours updating everyone. And also, the new skills will help you get insights much faster. So just as we have lean development, we should have lean research. What does lean research mean? It means that instead of just waiting until the final report is done, so hey, let us researchers do the research, and then when the research is done, we will produce this report and we'll send it to you. Instead of that, what we're going to do is create what I call open research kitchens. And what that is, is collaborative documents that I'm going to show you in a minute, where everybody can follow our progress live. Because sometimes people don't need to wait until the report is beautiful and ready to take the next action. Sometimes, yes, we need an insight that's very mature. But for other decisions, we can do with what are the first signals. And with those first signals, we can course correct very fast, right? So what's the minimum viable insight that each team needs is different. So that's why by giving them access to these kinds of uh, deliverables, or let's call them spaces. So this is a UXR open kitchen that we're working with here. And you can see what each member of the research team is working on now. So everybody from the tech team to the UX to UI can see what we're working on in real life in case that can help their work. Then they have uh, cumulative deliverables like personas that are updated with everything we learn. So if we're working on a specific feature with tech and we discover something, all the other teams will have access to the discovery. And then we have useful closed research. So everything that we've done in the past is accessible here. This helps us come up with research um, calendars like this. This allows us to move fast and break things. So uh, this is just an example of an agenda we have. You can take photos if you want. Uh, on Monday, we plan and we do team syncs. And then on Tuesday, we prototype and we test with real users. We have real users coming in every week, at least once a week. Once we test with users, we do revisions, we learn, we develop. And then after another session of prototyping on Thursday, they come back to us. And again, we show it our work, our progress. We have interactions every day. This helps us design our product with the user, not for the user. And it makes for much better products, much faster products. And it's just more fun to work with. Frank, is it more fun to work with? Yep. I almost didn't pay her to say yes there. So we're fast. Uh, now the problem is some teams can apply this and learn faster, but can they adjust? Research today is very linear, meaning how it works today is we get some objectives, then we plan, we collect, we analyze, and we report. Does that sound familiar? How many of you work on a get objectives, plan, execute, analyze, produce report? Did you? Show hands, there in your house as well. All right, nobody in house, but here, no one works in this linear way? You work in this linear way? Right, most of the teams I've worked with work like this. Now, what's the meaning of agile? Many people nowadays talk a lot about agile. And agile is this, and agile is that. But if you look at the original document, 
Agile just means that you can change as you learn. That is Agile as its most basic definition. And uh, interestingly enough, it's also Einstein's definition of intelligence. Einstein said, the true measure of intelligence is the ability to change. And that's basically what Agile means. So how do we make research agile, not linear? How do we make a research team that as we learn, we can change the whole plan, right? And adapt to new learnings as we go, rather than wait until the end, produce the report, and then wait for the next wave. So what are we gonna do less of? We're gonna do less of sticking to the plan and producing a report in the end, and we're gonna do more of what? Any ideas? What can we do? Yuli, do you have any idea? Mm. So hungry tonight. I'm going to like grab a pizza. Bro. You have you have food there, mate. Somebody get this man a pizza. He only came for the pizza. He doesn't care about research. Come on. I mean, me too. <laughs> no, thanks, Yuli. Still thinking, no worries. So what we do is we not only adjust as learning appear, but we're gonna tailor our reports not just to the outputs, not just to the audience, but the context. What do I mean by that? What I mean is we're going to create loops when we're planning research. We're going to plan them in a form that let us be iterative, right? So we launch a plan. Here you have uh, an alignment with the business, the POs. Once we have aligned what constitutes success for this research sprint, we go on our different methods. And then when we're sharing results, we have a loop. So this loop allows us, oh, if we didn't see the results we were expecting, how might we go back until we find out a solution that works for everybody? So it's in the way we design research, these loops. And also, as you can see here, we had to uh, anonymize it. This is the results of the same research, but for different teams, right? So for POs, we give them a result that, um, speak to their needs. And then for technology people, we use a whole different kind of uh, output, right? We don't have the same output for the same teams. We adapt the output of our research to the necessities of each team so that we ensure that we are helping them truly influence decision with our research. The next one is, we're almost there, guys. It's five out of six. The next one is, it's too focused. And this is very close to my heart. Because some teams can adapt, but they are not willing to adapt. What do I mean by this? A lot of research today, and this kills me to admit it, is only done to get a tick, right? Some POs, some business leaders just asked us to do perform some little research so that then they can say, yeah, yeah, we did some research. Just put the tick, man. Just verify our hypothesis. But great research should not verify. Great research should falsify. We should always be looking to falsify our ideas and learn that we were wrong, right? So how do we do this? We need to do less of just, you know, research that ticks the box. Yeah, 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 we did research and we verified someone else's idea. To forensic research. What do I mean by forensic research? As researchers, should behave as criminal investigators, right? You know, you have CSI here, criminal scene investigation, CSI Miami. You, you have that, you have those? We have to add like those teams, right? We have to see a behavior we like or we don't like in our products and ask, what happened here? Just do an investigation, treat it like a crime scene, like somebody was murdered. What were the forces in the user's mind that cause this behavior, right? If it's a behavior we don't like, we wanna get those forces to get rid of those uh, behaviors. And if we wanna increase those behaviors, we also need to get a hold of these forces so we can give them more of it. So how do we do criminal investigation in research, UX research? Oh, wrong button, let me fix it. Oh, uh, right. Yes, this screen, second one. This is a little rest I'm giving you to think about. What do you think, how do you think we do this? 
Uh, could you help me, Frank? I'm older than I look. I don't. How can we shift from verifying to falsifying? How do we look for these behaviors, these forces that are behind user behavior? Oh, wow, it's, it's more serious than I thought. Yeah, but and then we cannot click. Try to click. Little rest in case you at home needed to go to the bathroom. This is your cue to go to the bathroom. We could just stay in this. This is the best slide in the whole presentation. So there's no better slides from here. It's now. Okay. So we have a whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hit it. We have a whole presentation that pranked it for UX Thailand, I think. No, or was it for another forum called "The Customer Is Always Right"? Wrong. The customer is not always right because users are very fast to tell you what they want. But they're also very bad at telling you what they want, right? So how do we split the difference? Yeah, too many people. <laughs> Should I help? No, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's working now. It's working, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Don't worry. It's fix. Yeah. Bring the whole team. How many consultants do you need to fix? <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to not just stop at what the users say and what they do. We're going to dig deeper. We want to get to the structures. So what were the forces that were pulling us you know, from the existing product to the next? Instead of, because a lot of people asked us to interview and work with existing users, right? Users that have been with us for the longest time. And I always tell them, you can learn more from users that have switched recently than from a thousand that have stayed. Because the people who have switched have a reason to switch. We can analyze what made them switch. What are the attributes from our product that pull them in? What are the attributes for the other product that push them out, right? What are the forces of habit that uh, try to keep them and what are the magnetisms that push them out, right? So by analyzing these structures, by analyzing uh, users that have switched, we can learn a whole lot more than people who have stayed. We can learn from people who have stayed, just not enough that people who have switched recently, because we can apply criminal investigation much easier. And then study the mindsets. What's the mindset? What does success look like for this user, right? What does failure look like for this user? What are they trying to avoid? What are they trying to become? And then what role can we play in their lives to help them become more of what they want and less of what they don't want? That is the whole complete uh, kind of criminal scene investigation. Oh, arigatou gozaimasu. So here's uh, one of my most favorite tools to accomplish this, is testing cards and learning cards. Have you? Anyone seen this before? Yes, Carl. Who else? Prang, obviously, because <laughs> we work together. <laughs> Who else? Anyone that hasn't worked with it? Is it the first time you've seen this? OK, wow. Well, so what is a test card? So these work in combination. We first produce test cards before our research, and we produce learning cards after our research. So what's on a testing card? First thing on a testing card, our hypothesis. We believe that blah, 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 blah. So here, let me put this example for another client. We believe that adding self-service assistance can improve the experience at this step. That's our hypothesis. Next thing we have is the experiment. So to verify that hypothesis, we will build a prototype chatbot on a B landing page and compare a bench against the main page. So we have the hypothesis, the experiment, which we were going to validate it, and then the measurement. So in one column we write, during the test, we will measure these variables. In this case, session duration, click-through rate, and satisfaction after usage. And the most important part that everybody forgets, and it kills me every time, is what would we consider success? 
Okay, you told me that you're going to measure session duration. What does success look like? More than seven minutes. Perfect. Now I know that if we go above seven minutes, it will be considered a success. If we're below that, we won't go ahead. Next thing, click-through rate. Yes, but how much lift do we want? 5%? 5%. Perfect. We're putting these OKRs there. Satisfaction. What are we looking for? 8 out of 10 average. Perfect. So always remember, not just to put the measurement, but the goal that will measure if that is a success or a failure. Right? Now let's go to the learning guide. So now we have the hypothesis, the experiment, the variables, the uh, uh, measurements, success criteria. We carry out that experiment, and at the end, we have the results. The first column of the results is during the test, again, we measured these things, and then instead of the criteria for success, we put the observations, right? So the session duration. We said seven minutes is success. We observed nine minutes. So first great goal. Click-through rate. We wanted a 5% and we observed a 10%. Second great success. Satisfaction. We wanted 8 out of 10 average and we achieved 8 of 10 average. Great success. So now we have the learning part. So from these results, we learned that a chatbot was indeed the right feature, uh, but we should get a human assistant button for extreme users. Right? Those are the learnings. And then, and this is the most important thing in the whole lecture. So if you have been sleeping until now, please wake up, especially you at home. We have the actions. So because we have observed this, we learned that. So we're going to do this. Therefore, we will start developing the chatbot, building connections to the call center. Right? Always, always, always include the so what to research. If your research doesn't have a so what, it will not inspire action. And if it does not inspire action, your research is just bad entertainment, right? Which brings us to the last point. Is everybody ready for the last point? Yeah. Nice. Research today is too theoretical. It does not respect the so what. So how many of you, hands up also at home, I can see you, how many of you have started reading a report and you thought, oh, this is, seems to be interesting? And then halfway through, you just stopped reading because you were like, so what? Yeah, it's very interesting, but what should I do about it, right? How do I transform this insight into action? How many of you? No one. Oh, yeah, yeah, we have some. Okay, and at home? Let me see at home. Yeah, at home too. Perfect, perfect. We have, yeah, many hands at home. So... Good research, so good, good research describes what is. So here is what's happening. But great research also prescribes what if, right? So when I'm looking for a, a great research team, it's not just that they are able to tell me what is happening, but what should happen. What are some ideas that your research unveils that we can pursue as a next step, right? So how do we do this? We're gonna do less of just describing what is happening. So users want this, users said that, uh, this trend is changing or remains unchanged, right? And we're gonna go beyond description into prescription. So because this is happening, this is the best ideas to try out, right? We have to transform the right data into the right insight, and the right insight into the right action. That's great research. So how do we do that? This is a very complex graph. I had another graph, but apparently there was a lot of sensitive data, so we have to change it last minute. But here what we're saying is we're starting with the user stories, right? So we have a product. What does it mean to the potential audience of this product to succeed or fail? Tell me the story of success. Tell me the story of failure. And then once we have those stories, we ask what features could help them be more successful or less unsuccessful, right? Once we have the features, the next question is, are they in the app now or in your product now, right? Are they performing at the level that the user is satisfied with, better than the alternatives? If yes, perfect, but if no, 
what's the suggested next step, right? And once we have the suggested next step, we don't stop there. We also do the business case. And this is the second most important point, probably the first and most important point. But I already told you the most important point, so let's have it as the second most important point. We need to focus on profit. And I feel that many people, when I say that, think, oh no, researchers' job is not to focus on profit. That's a business. We are pure, right? We're not thinking of money all the time like they do. No, we must, must, must tie everything we do our insight with profit. Researchers that don't understand the business don't understand their true work. Because if we cannot tie a specific insight to the business growing through user success or uh, whatever other source, then we won't be able to justify the value of our work. And we will see what's happening right now, right? When times get tough, the first thing every design team does is fire all the researchers. Because they're saying, right? Because, hey, I don't know how these people contribute to my bottom line. So they're the first off. So by establishing a link between an insight and an impact on the bottom line, on the profit, how is this learning driving my revenues up or down or my costs up or down, right? How can it impact prices, volumes, fixed costs, uh, variable costs, right? By doing that, we can make the business case for our work so that we can stay in the company. But not only that, it's not only good for us, but we are also helping our products evolve with the user, not apart from the user, right? We're able to not only respond to user change, but anticipate user change, which is what business need to do today if they want to stay alive. So don't just do it for you, do it for the whole business. Right, so we have the sixth. Are you, how are you feeling? How's everybody feeling? Oh, too short, too long? Keep going. More. Some people are already really sleeping in the back. Let me see at home. We have six or seven people sleeping at home already. Right, their cat is trying to wake them up. So let's see if we have learned something today. The next step is gonna be a quiz. And I know it sounds difficult, but the winner will get seven billion baht paid by Kunchon over the next ten thousand years. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's ten billion yeah, Australian dollars, which is like thirty baht, something like that. I don't know the exchange rate. So I'm gonna ask you about behaviors that you think you should turn off or turn on. What you should you stop doing or start doing? So first one is research is too standardized, right? So we're only basing our research in qualitative, quantitative. Are we interviewing? Are we surveying, right? What should we start doing instead of this? What are you gonna start doing instead of this? Any hands at home? No one at home, everybody's asleep. Here, hand up. Nobody wants the 10 billion Australian dollars? Kunchan, just give them, man. Let's just send it in. Yes. Try thinking another way around. Yeah. Try thinking another way around. Yeah. So more ways around, right? Yeah. Let's have more innovative ways that, and let's mix them, right? If you are trying the same methods over and over again, you're doing something wrong. Mix and match. Learn about, I have another talk about innovative research methods, mainly through games. I suggest you all read in a book called innovation games because when your users are playing when someone is playing it doesn't have any defenses any defense mechanisms right many people when they are being interviewed they think they have to provide the right answer but when they're playing they're free like kids right so they will give you much more information right next one too siloed only research doing the job we should stop that and start Involving every everyone, even like people from the competition, people, random people in the street. Let's go. We are planning the New Year's <laughs> budget. Yes, right. Great point, by the way. Be more integrative. This is the keyword: integrative. Right. Include business. Include technology. Designers from the start. Third one. It's too slow. Right. 
I mean, we are overextending the deadlines. We have a lot of uh, activities and reports. What are we going to stop doing and start doing? What are we going to start to make it faster? Do you remember? Yes. Open kitchen. Oh, I love it. Oh, it might get famous. Bonus 10 billion. That's almost 100 Batman. Chill. Yes. I don't know. Like, if you want to use open kitchens, I'll be super proud. But uh, any creative space, any open space where researchers can work and everybody can follow, right? So instead of sending a finished report, we involve people as we are doing the research, as we are learning. Next one. Oh, it's too linear. It's just uh, get the objectives, I plan, conduct, analyze, report. What should we start doing against linearity? Sorry. Plan the feedback. Yes. Oh. Oh. We should start planning feedback loops, right? So when we are designing our research, we are producing insights all the time. And as those insights emerge, we must be able to change everything. That's the meaning of Agile. Always remember, if you learn something today, was that the true meaning of Agile is very simple. If you have POs, and if you do Scrum, and if you have Agile manifesto tattooed in your forehead, but then you're following the plan start to finish, then you're not Agile. It's how we react to new learnings, how we can adapt to new learnings that makes us agile or not. So from verifying, just having the tick, right? Hey, just uh, verify this to me, to interview some people and tell me what comes out of it. What are we going to do instead of that? Falsifying. Great research, falsify, not verify. We need to be criminal investigators. We need to see the behaviors that we want, that we don't want and you know like interrogate every possible force to see what was responsible for that behavior and finally it's too theoretical right we first have an input then we research and then we have an output what do we do instead of that nothing we love that so it's going to stay that way <laughs> what are we doing may the One hour behind. May is watching this from India. Yeah. So we're going to be more profit focused and more actionable, right? So what is the impact? Always, always, always invest in learning the numbers. If you still don't haven't read your business uh, profit and loss, go and read it. Know how your business earn money, how your business invest money, and see how you can increase the things that bring revenue, the revenue streams, and how can we reduce the cost infrastructure. Always in research, it's very important to see how everything affects those two. So, another meme, the first stage of uh, the evolution of research. First stage, we have researchers conducting interviews and analyzing the data to create reports. Next stage in this evolution would be multidisciplinary teams, not just researchers, mix techniques to create reports. The next wave of evolution is the same multidisciplinary teams are again mixing techniques, but instead of reports, they're creating interactive prototypes and generating new ideas as they are researching. And finally, the last one, what do you think it is? Chun, tell them. Kidding. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> the last one is the same multidisciplinary teams. They're mixing techniques and they're creating interactive prototypes, but they're doing so continuously. So the best teams I've worked with, either at Google, at Microsoft, at IKEA, were the ones that didn't have research sprints. They were always conducting research in some sort of way. It's never finished, right? So that uh, is what distinguishes the traditional research for continuous research. And the best performing product teams are always in continuous discovery, not research. So, and this is my final point tonight that I want to make you. When we make all these changes to the research team, it's not just the research team who is changed. 
This is the magic of product management. The magic of product discovery is that when we become a dis continuous discovery team, the whole company changes. So we stop this way of working that is more based on design thinking, whereby we research, then we define, we ideate, and we test, and we start behaving in a product mindset where we're constantly getting the right ideas and then getting these ideas right. And we're always, always in this loop. It's never finished. How does this create superior businesses is the more actionable our insights are, the faster and better we release. We are calculating that we can decrease 20% the times and 48% the costs. As we release faster and better, we increase satisfaction. I've got a 63% average in the uh, times that I've worked with. The more satisfied the users are, the more they use it. And usage often translates into revenue. This might depend on your own product, but it's a very good guess that the more people use your product, the more revenue they're generating for your business. But also the more usage they're uh, having, the more data they're leaving, right? Because the more they use, every single usage is more data. And with more data, we can have better insights, better insights, we have faster releases, faster, better releases, we have more satisfaction, more usage, more data. You see how this creates a virtuous cycle that sets us apart from the competition. It's impossibly hard to compete with these kinds of businesses that are including the user in their development so that they have better insights and then they're faster than us and they get more satisfaction so they get more usage and more data and then again better insights it's almost impossible to compete with these kinds of teams so this is how better research can lead to better oh again oh that was the climax <laughs> don't worry don't worry i got it got it got it i learned from my mistakes <laughs> because I'm a research lead. This is how these better products, better product management leads. So if we apply these continuous discovery methods or continuous discovery habits, as Teresa Torres calls it, wonderful, one of the best minds in the industry, we'll get better products. If we get better products, we'll get better markets. So these products will make the businesses that are working on them more fun because it's generally more exciting and uh, more productive to work in this way, but also the users will get uh, more success out of the interactions with the product. And as a result, we'll create a better world, hopefully, for everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. That's it for today. <laughs> it only took us. So let's keep in touch. Uh, my email is this. Uh, this is a QR that goes to the articles I'm writing. I'm currently writing an article on. Uh, product management, everything you always wanted to know on product management but were afraid to ask is coming out, I think, uh, next week. And so, and please, if you have any doubts, you want the slides or anything, uh, don't hesitate to let me know. I'm also a product coach, so if you need anything uh, from me, let's keep in touch. And now I'm going to leave it to Kunchon, who is going to start moderating the Q&A. Is that correct? Nice. All yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, can can we go back to the first first slide? Yeah, because Q and A actually we have. Um, I think we are quite pretty close, so we we can hands up and ask a question. Let's go to the first slide. Okay, ครับถึงช่วง Q and A นะครับก็ขอเชิญสปิเกอร์ที่อยู่ฮานมาอยู่บริเวณนี้หน่อยครับอ่ะคนแรกครับเอ่อมิสเตอร์วีดินเอ่อ our lead design system นะครับโอเคใช่ครับโอเค this is the design system specialist ครับ next one เอ่อคุณเกวนครับ lead UX research โอเคโอเค next one เอ่อวีดินนอ We don't at the hospital, right? <laughs> he he, a, a little bit sad. He get sick before this session. Okay, okay. Hi, Vilun. Hope you hope you well soon. Get well soon. So next, um, 
คุณปรางครับ X and Service Design Researcher ของเรานะครับโอเคแล้วก็ผมแล้วก็คุณเอลิเกนะครับโอเค any question in Thai or in English can be ครับโอเคครับเอลเกี่ยวกับไรเตอร์ก็ได้นะครับรีเสิร์ชก็ได้ครับหรือว่าดีไซน์ซิสเต็มหรือ UX UI นะครับ No โอเคที่ไทยใช่ไหมคะอืมโอเคคิดว่าอ๋ออะไรที่ยากที่สุดในการที่เป็นชาร์เลนจ์ที่สุดในการที่ทำรีเสิร์ชที่ไทยโอเคถ้าเทียบกับประสบการณ์ของปางนะคะก็เคยทำที่อังกฤษมาบ้างนิดหน่อยกับ government ของเขาอะไรเงี้ยคือเขาค่อนข้างเปิดกว้างมากๆแล้วก็ยังไงดีเขาค่อนข้าง flexible มากๆแล้วก็เปิด freedom มากๆแล้วก็เหมือนตอนที่เราทำรีเสิร์ชช่วงนั้นอะเราก็ไม่ได้เป็นแบบ in the big company เนาะเพราะฉะนั้นมันก็ยากมากๆากที่เขาจะ trust ในใน value ของรีเสิร์ชของเราอะไรเงี้ยแล้วก็อีกหนึ่งสิ่งที่ที่รู้สึกว่าแตกต่างมากคือเขาเจอเพราะว่าการทำรีเสิร์ชที่ไทยในการเข้าหาคนหรือว่าการที่จะขอ interview คนมันค่อนข้างยากเพราะว่าเขาเจอเราค่อนข้างแบบอยู่ดีๆเดินดุมๆๆๆเข้าไปหาเขาข้างถนนอย่างเงี้ยทุกคนจะเอ้ยอะไรของเธอเนี่ยอะไรอย่างเงี้ยนึกออกไหมแต่ว่าถ้าสมมติเป็น culture ของอังกฤษหรือว่าไม่แน่ใจว่าประเทศอื่นเป็นยังไงนะแต่ว่าถ้าอังกฤษอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคือเขาจะ open มากกว่าแล้วก็ให้ระยะเวลาเรามากกว่าในการที่จะ spend time กับเรากับ as a strangers อะไรอย่างเงี้ยอืมก็เลยรู้สึกว่าในในใน outcome อ่ะมันอาจจะไม่ได้แตกต่างขนาดนั้นแต่ว่าถ้าใน during the process มันมันค่อนข้างสบายกว่าแล้วก็ flexible กว่าในแง่นั้นอย่างเงี้ยค่ะใช่พี่เกณฑ์มีเสริมไหมเห็นด้วยเลยก็เห็นด้วยกับปรางสิ่งที่คิดว่างานรีเสิร์ชอะค่ะอันที่จริงแล้วมันก็อาจจะไม่ใช่โน้ตฮาวของทางฝั่งไทยเนาะหรือแม้แต่ทางเอเชียก็แล้วแต่
คราวนี้เนี่ยเวลาที่ approach เหมือนที่ฟังเล่าอ่าซึ่งมันเป็นประสบการณ์ที่เราเจอเหมือนกันก็คืออ่าไม่ว่าจะเป็นไปเจอกันแบบแบบตัวต่อตัวเนาะหรือว่าเป็นการทำรีเสิร์ชแบบเป็นอินเทอร์วิวผ่านออนไลน์เนี้ยการจะทำให้เขาเปิดใจอะค่ะเราแชร์กับเราเนี่ยก็อาจจะต้องใช้เวลานิดนึงคือต้องเหมือนกับกลุ่มทำให้แบบอินเดอร์มูดนิดนึงเนาะกว่าจะให้เขาเล่าเรื่องที่เราอยากจะรู้ค่ะก็น่าจะมีบาเรียเรื่องนี้แหละเนาะที่ค่อนข้างจะชัดอันนี้ค่ะวันนั้นอาเซอิลิก have you ever have a from the with like a collaboration with other team without like or the design team it's just like with this or supplier or any other ground have you ever have the problem with that like uh, to like uh, execute your research or just present your research result or and how do you do that Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, so, the main problem researchers tend to have is that we do sometimes we do great work, but it doesn't reach the decision unit, right? So the people making the decisions never get to see our work, right? So how do we get research in those meetings with the president, right, with the CEO, to actually get, you know, the the action out of the insight? That's the biggest problem. I remember working for a company that I cannot disclose, and uh, you know the CEO would never meet me. You know he was too busy, never time for research. You know just you know he kept doing these things and never, never, never met us. So he said no time. So we said perfect. We will create. We will transform all this research into pills that you can consume in 30 seconds in your car, right? So we transformed uh, our oh, the insights. We recorded ourselves, right, and made 30 second pieces that he could watch in his car, right. And so that is a way in which we transformed a problem, a weakness, into a strength. Because those, the consumer of those pills, weren't just the president; it was the whole company. They went viral inside the company. Even some competitors showed me the the pills. As it is this year, right? So he didn't even reach the competitor, which was not a good thing. We didn't, you know, thought of this, but um, we transformed that weakness that he would never see the results of our research into a strength that not only got him interested. So he started coming to our meetings almost every week because he loved uh, the pills. But also, all the company watched those pills, so everybody now had a better sense of the strategy. Of the uh, results and of the actions that follow those results, so it's much more effective. Thank you. Okay, a uh, little bit, slightly to uh, design system or UI design. So um, I have some more question for you, like um, how the research result affect to the UI design. Um, first of all, before I start, I just want to understand if. <laughs> Do you guys understand what the design system is? You all know what the design system is? Okay, so before I explain, I just want to maybe someone from the audience can give an idea of a design system because a lot of the time design system is misunderstood, right? We all think design system is just a Figma library or it's just a style sheet, right? It's not just a style sheet or a library. It's, it's the whole system that runs the company, right? It's the the tone of voice, or it's it's the colors, or it's it's the content. It's how business logic work. It's so much in design system. So research plays a big role as a part of design system. So now to answer his question, how does it affect how research affects UI? Of course, every analytic data that we receive is something that we can improve the design system in many ways. You can, so for example, if you get a Google Analytics, and you see that, oh, this button's not being clicked very often. What can we do about it? That affects the design system where we can say, okay, maybe we need to change the size of the button, right? Or we got to find a different position. So design system is a constant evolving system. A design system that works for a particular company may not work for another company. 
is is a beautiful system. Yeah, I don't know what more. Uh, ex- more I mean, I I can talk about design system every day. I mean, that's this is my thing. So if you guys want to ask me anything more particular about design system because it's a modern thing, right? I will highly recommend even researchers know what design system is. Okay, and don't tell people that is Figma library. That's not it. <laughs> so yeah. Yes, Carl. Yes. How do you get them? So there's many ways to get developers involved in design system. First of all, share. I'm going to say this word: share your Figma link. <laughs> but it doesn't mean I'm not saying design system is just Figma libraries, right? It's but Figma, uh, design system is not just libraries. It's about documentation, right? So devs need to understand how we work. So normally what we do is we create uh, online tools where the devs can access the documentation. They can read about it. And from the documentation, they get linked to Figma. Then they can see. And again, it's not Figma library. I'm just talking about the whole thing. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> yeah, so we've been using a new tool. Look into it. It's called Fig Mayo, like mayonnaise, right? Fig, look at this, a very nice online tool. It's free. Uh, it allows you to upload all your com- your colors, your typography, elevation, tone of language, whatever you want that runs a, the design system, you can upload up there. And everybody in, in your company and outside the company can access it. That's the whole point of this online tool. So, Kyle, I hope I, I answered that question too. Thank you. Yes. Um, อันที่จริงอีกโรหนึ่งที่พี่พี่คิดว่ามันเป็นโรคิดเด้นของบริษัทเชื่อค่ะคือมองว่าเราคืออินฟลูเอนเซอร์เนาะคราวนี้อินฟลูเอนเซอร์ที่ที่ดีละกันอาจจะต้องทำหลายอย่างอย่างแรกเลยคือน่าจะต้องมีการดีฟายโกลที่มันเคลียร์ค่ะเคลียร์ไอเดียเคลียร์ไอเดียชัดๆแล้วก็มีสโคปงานแล้วก็เข้าใจว่าเราต้องไปคอลลาบอร์เรตกับใครอย่างที่สองก็คืออันนี้น่าจะเป็นเรื่องที่ทางคุณเอ็นริกน่าจะแชร์ไว้เมื่อกี้ก็คือเรื่องของสเต็กโคเดอร์เอนเกจเมนต์การเอาเขาเข้ามาในช่วงเวลาที่ถูกต้องเราต้องไปคอลลาบอร์กับเขาช่วงไหนหรือว่าเป็นอินไซต์แบบไหนที่เขาอยากได้อ่ะมันคือการจําเข้าไปเข้าใจเพอร์สเปกทีฟของเขาแล้วก็เพนพอยต์ของแต่ละยูเอ่อบีค่ะว่าเขาอยากได้อะไรเราก็มีคอนซิสเทนต์ในการส่งรีพอร์ตให้อาจจะมีเรื่องของอิมแพคของอินไซต์ด้วยก็ได้อย่างเช่นเราอาจจะต้องคอยเดลิเวอร์เรื่องของอ่า Uh, engagement บางทีอาจอาจจะอยากรู้เรื่องของ engagement แล้ว research ไปช่วยเขาได้ยังไงบ้างหรือว่าไป increase พวก user satisfaction อย่างเงี้ยค่ะหรือว่าอาจจะไปช่วยเขา reduce cost หรือว่า reduce risk ต่างๆอันนี้ก็จะเป็นอีกเรื่องหนึ่งอ่าอีกอันหนึ่งก็คือที่คิดว่าเป็น killing story เลยก็คืออ่าการทำ share back ให้มัน compelling อ่าการทำอ่า storytelling เนาะเหมือนเหมือนกันหมดก็คืออ่ามันต้องมันจะมีความ emotional ก็คือเป็นเรื่องของอารมณ์ขึ้นมาละคราวนี้มันก็จะมีสตรัคเจอร์ในการเล่าที่เหมือนไป seduce เขานิดนึงอาจจะเป็นวิธีเล่าแบบเป็น problem solution หรือว่า benefit ที่พี่ใช้บ่อยๆนะคะหรือว่าอาจจะมองเป็นในในแง่ที่ว่าเราทำให้มันเป็นเหมือน hero v i l l a i n เป็น good and bad um, journey อันนี้ก็อาจจะช่วยเขาเข้าใจในเรื่องที่มัน complex อ่ะคือแตกประเด็นออกมาให้เขาเข้าใจได้เขาก็จะใบจริงมีอีกหลายเรื่องเหมือนกันเนาะวิธีจะ convince แค่แบบ department หนึ่งนี้ต้องใช้หลายหลายกิจกรรมเหมือนกันเลย absolutely like I sometimes never begin to plan without the business team in the room because if you plan you need their objectives right you need to make sure that They validate every state of the process because if not, they will be a pain later. So even if you do it without them to say, "Okay, we cannot wait for them, so let's do it and then wait what happens," right? That will cause way more time loss. That involving them from the beginning 
so that there's an alignment of what success looks like and how we're going to get that success, right? So they're updated every step of the way, and then they can become part of every step of the way if they want to. Others don't, but they know. Hi there. Hi, mom. How are you doing? <laughs> Does that begin to answer your question? Yeah, perfect, perfect. No, of course. Thank you for the question. Beautiful. Yeah, sorry. Can, can I have a follow up questions? I think uh, you mentioned about uh, your second part, right, to Cyril. So uh, you suggest a way to solve it to involve everybody together. and reconduct into something positive and creative, right? Because everybody's right in some way, right? Everybody has a little bit of truth, but nobody has all of it. So how do we go about getting the truth out of every perspective and craft a way forward? That's orchestration. And if you ask me for a tip, it would be to uh, do what I call a win room. A win room is before anybody speaks, we're going to focus on what success looks like for all of us. Right, so the best product achieve this for business, this for tech, this for marketing, and once we know what's the shared vision for success, everybody will become less aggressive because they know that we need everybody. We are all in the same team, right? The competition, the alternatives, are the real enemy. So it changes the tone of voice and it changes the conversation a lot. So win rooms to me are part of the answer, not all of the answer. We need also our frustration skills. Thank you. Do we have any questions from home? Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um when you when your team are full of researcher and sometimes you are divided into squads to work on different projects, and you work for many years and you did a lot of researches, how you store your data in order for your team member to find all those findings and learnings and, you know, don't have to do like double work thing, like how you spread and store and keep the dialect, like the directory of your data. Yeah, how, how you do that. So I I was struggling a lot because I my first job was in investment banking. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, second in consulting, then marketing, then design, professor, all of this. And every time I switch works, I was in a panic. Like all my data, all the access to these documents is going to die. Right? Where can I save all this data? And I had a very hard time. And then it hit me. You know, this data is like a yogurt. It has an expiration date. Like if I discovered something for some industry in some geography at some time, that is good indicator, but it has an, a shelf life, right? And so you shouldn't be so scared to lose it because if it's a long time ago, it's more than six months I discovered, maybe it's a good idea to rediscover it sometimes, right? I'm not saying just throw everything that is more than six months old. I'm saying store it in a way that is 
not very painful for you. So for instance, I use a lot of Node Shelf, I use a lot of Notion, I use a lot of Google Drive. And then I have uh, uh, an AI, a chat GPT that I created to access everything and then get me the, that's like a good way to use AI, right? You feed them all your PDFs and then you can train it and then ask questions. But don't worry about losing things that are old because it's better sometimes to rediscover the insights rather than to recover the insights. Thank you. Next one. Oh. Okay. อ่าช่วยๆไปให้หน่อยนะครับเวลาที่เราทําดีไซน์เซตไม่ว่าจะเป็นพวกคอมมานแนนต่างๆครับมีการมีการรีเสิร์ชก่อนมั้ยก่อ
จแล้วแล้วก็มาเป็นอ่าจะทํายังไงให้มันดีขึ้นหรือว่าถ้ามันมายเนอร์พอยต์มากๆก็คือเราจะต้องทํำยังไงให้มันสื่อสารได้ตรงจุดมากขึ้นอะไรเงี้ยค่ะเพราะฉะนั้นก็ก็มีการเปลี่ยนแปลงตลอดเวลาค่ะประมาณนั้นอืบ้านก็พออ่ะทำอยู่ Yeah so uh, I ask in English but I, I wanted everyone to like share the experience so we know that we wanted to integrate UX research into every department right so at the end of the day we all need to be involved in the research process I want to know like for each department what are the things like what are the one thing that made you believe in UX research Of course, yes. <laughs> so, from my perspective, like, what's one thing that made me believe in UX research? It's the results that comes out from it, right? Because a lot of the times, s so e for example, I'm working on a project. The only way we can be a good designer, a good design system engineer, or whatever it is, is to receive uh, data from external, right? We have to be. We have to understand what. We are building for who we are building for, which user, right? And the only way that could come from is UX research. So that's that's very important for me to understand how does it affect the product. It's only by doing more research. So these quantitative data or qualitative data is very important. Uh, so I, yeah, I mean I cannot say research is not good. I mean it's the it's very important for any organization. Yeah. <laughs> เวลาเข้ามาเขาเข้ามาอินโวลกับทีมรีเสิร์ชใช่ไหมแล้วทํายังไงให้เขาเชื่อในผลอะไรต่างๆเงี้ยครับก็ต้องบอกว่า Data เรามีเรามีหลายแกนมากๆเนาะทั้ง Qualitative Social Listening Quantitative Analytic อะไรต่างๆนานาอย่างเงี้ยพอ Data มันมีทุกแกนนะครับคือเขาจะเขาจะเชื่อเชื่อมั่นมากๆมากมากกว่าการเราการที่เราไปเทสเมเมทอดโลยีใดเมทอดโลยีเดียวอย่างเช่นอินเทอร์วิวห้าคนมาแล้วอย่างเงี้ยเขาเขาจะเขาจะรู้สึกว่าเฮ้ยมันไบแอสหรือเปล่าใช่ไหมครับทีนี้พอเราเอา Data จาก Analytic Behavior ที่เป็นแบบหลักหลักพันหลักหมื่นหลักล้านอะไรอย่างเงี้ยครับเข้ามาแมปเข้ากับอินเทอร์วิวแล้วก็โซเชียลลิสเนิงแล้วก็อาจจะมีรีพอร์ตที่เป็นเรฟเฟรนซ์มาแมปกันทั้งหมดบางบางดีไซน์เราก็ต้องใช้เตียรีบ้างใช้ทฤษฎีของการดีไซน์เหมือนเหมือนไลฟ์ที่แล้วผมก็คือโอเคทฤษฎีไหนที่มันแมทแมปเข้ากับงานดีไซน์ตัวนี้แล้วเราก็เอามาผูกกันทั้งหมดพอเราเล่าแบบนี้ครับเวลาที่ไปพรีเซนต์อันนี้จากประสบการณ์เลยเนาะเวลาที่ไปพรีเซนต์กับเอ่อทางไม่ว่าจะเป็นบิสเนสหรือว่าเทคอะไรอย่างเงี้ยเขาจะไม่มีคําถามเลยอันนั้นคือแบบควิกวินเอ้ยวินเขาเรียกว่าอะไรมันคือเป้าหมายของเราเลยว่าโอเคพอเขาไม่มีไม่มีคําถามเขาก็จะถกในเรื่องของโอเคทีนี้เรามาวางแผนไงกันต่อ next action เป็นไงเ,เรื่องของหลังบ้านเป็นไง solution เราต้องทำยังไง tech อะไรต่างๆนานาอย่างเงี้ยครับเนาะพอพอพอเห็นพอตอบตอบคำถามครอบคุณพอได้เนาะมองเขาใช่อ๋อทางบ้านนะครับโอเครีดินอ๋อเอลิกเอไอ so I had a um, I teach uh, at a university and I had a problem with the headmaster because I, AI was prohibited in all their classes so all other teachers were prohibiting students to use AI to You know, submit their papers and do their presentations, except me, who I not only didn't prohibit it, but I made it mandatory to use AI. And the reason I did that is because many people are very in the know when it comes to what it can do, and they heard things, but not a lot of people had actually used it, right? And prompt engineering, the ability to generate the right prompts and to communicate with AI. Is a skill that is more important than what I'm teaching, 
right? Uh, so answering your question, how can we prepare designers for AI is first of all, read and, and consume a lot of content on prompt quality. There's a lot of great designers out there showing great prompts they're using to do their work, learn from them and try it, really try it every day. Sometimes I, even when I don't use AI to do some task, I will actually use it, not because I want the results, but I want to see what are the possibilities of this. And I'm always stretching the possibilities. I use it for everything, then I don't apply it, right? But I test it, test it with everything. And I think everyone should do it as well, because it's good to have your finger very, very, very deep into AI and see how it moves, how it evolves so that you get a feel of what it can do. So when opportunities arise, you're ready to use it, right? And you know how to use it. So this is a recommendation for everybody. Everybody get into whatever tool you want. And there's so many great tools like Wizard.io or, or, or the one, what was the one that we saw a few months ago that you put the UR, URL for a web page and it gives you the whole uh, pass to written. My point is use it even though you're not going to apply it to always get a sense of what it is and what it can do for you in the future. Now, written. Well, um, yeah, there are plenty of AI tools now, but the one that you mentioned, uh, so basically what it does is you just send your design to it and it just creates HTML uh, HTML code for you. But again, see, that's not the point. The whole point is get your hands wet in AI. Every designer has me, asked me this question, like, written, am I going to run out of job because AI is going to take over my UI skills or my UX research skills? This happens all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, so I would highly recommend better to be ahead of the curve by using AI as your companion. So use it to support your process. So if you have some question, instead of going Googling, just use your AI. It's not nothing wrong with it. Absolutely only benefit you. You're going to increase your productivity your results rather than just waiting and asking your friends, use AI as your partner in crime, right? Just get it with, as a tool, exactly. And when AI becomes ultra smart, then you become the slave. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that AI is a tool for the team research. For example, we upload the file PDF to the team research. It's a tool for the team research. It's a tool for the team research. AI ตัวเนี้ยสามารถเจเนเรทภายในหนึ่งนาทีหรือห้านาทีมันเซฟเวลาเราไปแบบโอ้แทบจะเซฟไปหนึ่งเดือนเลยมั้งที่เราต้องม
hundred percent every day? No, it should be. Yes. You should be using it every day. Now, one thing I can give you a small tip. So if you're doing design system, right. And you're, when you're working with multiple components in chat GDP on the left side, you see the panels of all the questions you asked it, right? Each make each item one component and you feed him information every time you make a change. Oh, today we did this. Next day we did this. What's happening is you're evolving your chat GDP to follow you. Because if you give, if you start a new item, you give him information, he doesn't know what you did in the previously. Every item is separate. So create items per component and feed him information. Oh, today we found out that, hey, this button's not working. You communicate with him as a partner. Like imagine I have a UI team members, right? I, I've involved them in every process so they don't they, they know what's happening, right? But same with AI. You cannot start a new chat every single time you have a question. Feed him, feed him, feed him. That's how it works, yeah? Information, yeah. โอเคเอ่อก็วันนี้ก็ขอบขอบคุณทุกท่านมากๆเลยนะครับที่เข้ามาฟังนะครับก็เดี๋ยวหลังจากเซสชั่นนี้เนาะก็อาจจะมีเ